Joe. Hi, Michelle. How are you? I'm Hi. great. I'm so excited to be talking to you today. Um, I'm Amy. I think you know that. Um, I'm Amy Wilkins, and I work at the College Board, where I'm a senior fellow for social justice. Um, and I wanted to talk to you today about, you know, your movie and what I know about African American male achievement in America. And it's great to be talking to you in your kitchen. Thank you. This is called the kitchen of learning. The kitchen where you cook up learning, you cook up positive images of young black men. I love it. Um, so, you know, I shared with you some College Board data that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, you know, what we know is that fewer than um, one in three boys who have the potential to do well in AP classes are actually taking those classes. That means we have very, very high achieving boys that for a variety of reasons aren't being given the opportunity to challenge themselves even more. Um, and that's distressing to me. You know, I'm the mom of a sixth grade African American boy. Um, and it worries me. Um, that, you know, for I think a variety of reasons, um, he may not be challenged enough in his schools. And I'm wondering what you guys think about it, what you've learned about it as you've, you know, made the fabulous movie. No, so I'm, uh, I'm challenged by it also. And, and uh, but before I talk about my own son, I can speak to my own experience as an African American male growing up in Los Angeles where I was identified uh, as a person who was, uh, could, could benefit from AP courses. And, and, and I recall uh, convincing my counselors uh, to remove me from those courses. Really? In, my partic in fact, I broke into the counselor's office and <laughs> took my, uh, my, my schedule. Uh, and, and, and one of the things for me is that I... I felt like uh, I didn't belong there. Mm -hmm. I felt like it was a predominantly Asian cohort. Uh, I wasn't being invited to their parties. Uh, and when I went to the other parties, uh, they weren't interested in discussing some of the things I uh, thought was important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I just changed my uh, my my schedule and I found that I spent most of high school uh, not involved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. no, no, once I removed myself from those AP courses, that AP track, I had completed most of the high school work. Right, right. So, uh, and, and luckily I was saved because uh, I went to a state college. Mm -hmm. I, I woke up one day and I said, you know what? this is not for me. I wanted to be a mathematician. Uh -huh. In order to be a mathematician, I had to go back to what I had learned prior, hard work, uh, persistence, and I was one of the few who made it. But the vast majority of, uh, of my uh, classmates who opted out uh, never were able to return to that level of scholarship. Right, right. So... My son is very different, and the and the boys now are very different. But uh, I can't help but feel that it's a similar kind of experience where adolescents are are looking for community. They're looking to identify, and so we have to provide them with a certain narrative that if you Absolutely. can be African American and you can do math and science or or critical English uh, or foreign language, and the question we always get asked this question. Uh, why why aren't uh, middle class parents who know the importance of this uh, kind of curriculum and kind of study? Why are they allowing their kids to opt out? Or, uh, and, and we have a couple of answers, but uh, I'm going to let Michelle talk. No, I mean I think uh, some of what Joe's narrative reflects to there are certain things that 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 have not changed, and it has to do with the perceptions of what you know our boys are capable of and the degree to which uh, everyone has internalized those perceptions. Or there's this, you know, there's this desire to protect them from potential failure. Um, and it, we have to kind of turn that on its head, really, and understand that challenging and even a failing within a challenging environment is an opportunity for growth and an opportunity to push 
um, uh, the boundaries and really kind of raise the, the, the level of what we think our, our kids' potential is. So it's kind of something we've all kind of, we've all internalized to a certain extent. And uh, we have to understand that we're missing out on an opportunity by not, by not being present in those environments. I, I think that's absolutely, absolutely right. And the saddest thing for me about this is when you see the adult attitudes about what African American boys can and can't do and who they are, and when the boys begin to own those attitudes themselves, right? We did a number of focus groups with African American boys who had the potential to do well in AP, and they kept saying, AP is not for people who look like me, right? And it is that if they had internalized all of the signals that they were getting from adults about who does challenging academic work, who achieves at high levels. And you know, to me it feels like the, these are the kids, right? So we, and we're the adults, so we, it is our work to undo this for them, right? It, it's our work to, as Joe said, write a narrative that is expansive enough um, for African American boys so that they can find themselves and find their identity in a broad range of pursuits, including challenging academic work, right? Yes, and it's, it's actually uh, our role as parents to challenge those perceptions. We need to demand their presence in AP classes. We need to challenge the counselors and everyone who's, who's, who's uh, maybe, you know, it could be their best of intentions by not offering right. thinking, but we have to challenge them and put their feet to the fire in terms of we're the first kind of line of, of resistance where these perceptions are concerned as parents. And I think we have to stick because, as Joe said, you know, you can get in, but then when, you know, either the counselor suggests or the teacher suggests or the child suggests, I don't want to do this anymore, I mean, we got to keep our foot in everybody's back. Joe, you were about to say something. Well, the, the question, because uh, I can recount or uh, speak to many horror stories, the question is what are the concrete things that can, can take place to, to help these kids stick? And what are the things that we can do as both parents and and teachers, administrators, uh, to counteract uh, this this brain drain, if, if you will? Uh, because these are the guys who are going to become the physicians, the attorneys. Uh, these are this the our, our civil rights leaders, our leaders of all all all, ty all, all types. One of the things that we hear. Uh, is that if we push our sons to study a few hours a night, uh, then we're taxing them. But in fact, that's what the uh, kids do. And right. if you look at studies of who studies and who doesn't, and how many hours they spend and how many hours uh, they watch television, uh, we basically see a, almost a linear uh, relationship between uh, the work uh, and the rewards of that work. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things I think we have to do is start educating parents at an early age. You know, I'm always shocked when I'm in a meeting, and um, and and they're like we're in a national crisis, right. and uh, we say, you know, study a couple of hours a night. And then someone will stand up, and there'll be a movement towards why are you uh, why why are you taking all of their free time? Let boys be boys. Right. So you know, our boys on average watch fifty to seventy hours of television a week. Oh my lord! I, I, I and the middle class numbers are are off the hook. Right. Uh, they're in the fifties. Uh, lower middle class goes to 60s and 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 the poor uh, in the 70s. So so our our boys can stand to lose uh, you know 10 to 20 hours of TV watching absolutely uh, and put it into reading and in fact the benefits of that outweigh of anything else that they could put that time into uh, uh, basketball football and and we make the case that they can do that plus. Uh, study a little bit more, but but how do we give parents the tools to counter that? And yeah. uh, and I think we have to take a note from the Jeffrey Canada uh, group. You know, you have to start teaching parents early uh, what is expected of them as parents because we don't know. 
and uh, and and what the and how resilient the boys can be, and, and uh, also given uh, some insight in, into what other parents are doing, best practices, if you will. Yeah. I was going to say a couple things. One is, you know, we can ask our schools for help in creating norms. I mean, for example, my son's school says no TV during the week, right? And so that becomes the norm at his school. So other kids aren't talking about TV at school in the day. Other, you know, I, I can say to him, you know, Stephen isn't watching TV. And so if the school sets a norm, it reinforces the parent and then you aren't swimming upstream so hard, right? And that seems to me something we can ask our schools to do for us, um, to back us up when we set those kind of rules. I think there's one thing we can do. One of the things I'm curious about, Joe, that you mentioned was the sense of community and not being invited to the Asian parties. I mean, it sort of seems to me with technology, we can create communities for these kids, right? We can create Google. They should be hanging out talking to each other, not us. But, you know, are there ways to create communities for kids so they feel, I think, you know, there is nothing stronger in adolescence than the feeling of wanting to belong and to belong to a group. And it seems to me that if we adults can take responsibility for giving kids the tools to find community even beyond their school, beyond their classroom with other kids who are doing the same kind of stuff, that'll make them feel less freakish, right? I mean, that's one of the problems we face. Well, well uh, that's what our son uh, ended up doing. Mm -hmm. Not using the internet so much, uh, but he found affinity groups in the city of New York uh, uh, generally, they were the sons and daughters of, of, of uh, people of color in um, the independent schools. Mm -hmm. uh, they developed uh, a, a weekly meeting. Uh, literally, there were uh, several hundred of these students in the New York area who met in smaller groups or subcommittees that, mm -hmm. that they chaired. They had their own party network. Uh, but there was always a commitment uh, to learning, uh, to scholarship, uh, as well as to hip hop, dance, and eating yeah. hamburgers. Yes, yes, yes. And that that really were those that network of friends was really the uh, the the rock for certainly for Idris throughout his high school uh, uh, years. And uh, they've maintained, actually, that connection through into college. So it's definitely important what you say about the schools reinforcing, because having peers that, that create a norm that's uh, positive in that way is really what, where the kids will buy in at that point. The buy-in has to come through, through that environment uh, uh, of positive reinforcement. And there's something very interesting about that group because someone, I, I went to some lecture and they talked about the prep schoolers in New York. If you look on their Facebook page, they have a reference to hip hop somewhere that they work for a company. It's part of their, 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 their self-perception, which they get from the media. Right. So, uh, so what, what, what they were able to do is actually create another world where they were um, the norm and and that that was quite good that now the other interesting thing is that we attempted early on to have him involved in activities with other um, african-american youth mm -hmm. and uh, and some of that appeared to backfire on us mm -hmm. I, I remember taking him to a, a, a a basketball camp in my overzealousness uh -huh. uh, and and he came back and he said dad that 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 they're taking my money they take my sandwich and, and I realized that he was not uh, familiar with that environment and I had not uh, 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 helped him to gradually uh, uh, acclimate to that environment uh -huh. And so it was just as traumatic as being in the in the Dalton or environment or the uh, all Asian environment that that I grew up in. But and it's so, also, isn't it also something about them making it for themselves, right? Anything we touch, right, it becomes a problem if they own it. And it sounds like the the network that Idris became part of was you know student made, student led, right, and not adult fabricated. 
That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, and so, absolutely. And so maybe the question becomes, can schools create space for those things, right, so that kids can create their own networks? Um, but, you know, I mean, it, 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 it makes a lot of, right, there's a role for parents, there's a role for the schools, and there's a role for the kid themselves. And it's a terribly complicated thing to get all of these pieces, uh, you know, go, pulling in the same direction. Yes, right? yes, definitely, definitely, so that everybody's on the same page and that everybody kind of is, is, is challenging these perceptions and, and, and challenging how we're, we're actually executing our, 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 our assumptions and our expectations. And, and, and yeah, go ahead. How did, how did, I mean, you guys have clearly been quite effective in doing this. How did you make all the pieces, you know, go in the same direction? How did you get everybody on the same page if you had to tell folks that the one thing we did was, you know, or the three things? Well, I think one of the major things we did was not lower the bar, however hard that was. Not lowering the bar in terms of what we felt our son was capable of. Secondly, I really think that there was a level, after some of the hurdles that we went through with the school that Idris is at, there was a level of partnership involved in terms of him being able to, one, um, uh, have an African-American male advisor uh, and teacher through his high school that, again, the same way you're saying, ha was on the same page and was right. able to help him both socially and emotionally, but also, you know, push that academic standard of what he was capable of. And it was coming from somebody who looked like him. That's and that was, that was, that was key. So uh, there was a level of partnership involved in what we did and what we felt was necessary and our communications with the school, the institution itself. Well, I, I would point, uh, you know, first of all, if we were going to make recommendations to other family, yeah. we would never end with three. We might have 33 right. or, or, or 103 recommendations. Right. But, but one of the things that helped us is uh, and it helped it happen gradually. Is learning process, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and and so that 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 we had to understand that there was no no endpoint to learning, that uh, that mistakes could be made, mm -hmm. and that we could recover from those mistakes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So early on, you know, we had no shame. We spoke to uh, as many people as we could. Uh, we attempted to reach out to other black families when we saw just the inkling of struggle, and 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 we you and, and that was our salvation. But look at this. This is an interesting uh, factoid. Uh, we had problems talking with those African American parents because they were struggling with the same thing. Uh -huh. and, and they were, they were in pain, uh, and and actually dealing with their own issues. And so instead of taking that as a, a second failure, our own son's struggle and our ability, inability to communicate with someone that we were we were uh, felt it, uh, similar to, we didn't stop. We went to other parents outside of that community. Uh -huh. we, we went as far as Boston, uh, and over the years, you know, we've spoken to. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of parents mm -hmm. uh, and hundreds mm -hmm. of experts. Oh, 55 experts, but, actually. But, I mean, Joe is touching on something key, you know, in addition to, you know, having conversations with the institution, you know, setting the bar high for your child and providing the support that that's needed for that. But other is really the peer, our own peer-to-peer -peer interactions with right. other parents. So, because a lot of times we're feeling isolated, we're making decisions about AP courses that sometimes are in isolation. But if right. we're sharing information, either with parents who've already been through it, or parents who are going through it at the same time, we can compare notes, provide our own networks of support, and again, reinforce what you're saying, the same message across the board. And that, we found, was critical in terms of uh, uh, the, the reinforcement and support we got through our experiences. So the question is, how can you create that kind of support network and understanding of the of uh, the unlevel playing field and the needs of the kids without going to Boston from New York or right. without uh, leaving your community? And and one of the things that we've heard over and over again is you have 
to help the school help you. In other words, why is why can't the school provide safe places uh, for parents to learn and discuss amongst mm -hmm. themselves, uh, and for teachers uh, to understand the particular uh, socio cultural needs of uh, African American and, and uh, parents and other small affinity groups within their system. For as for example, if I know am a teacher, and I know that culturally African American parents ha have uh, more so much more suspicion uh, and and trepidation uh, when it comes to placing our kids in AP courses. I should be prepared to have that discussion right. with, with each of those parents without offending them. Right. Because uh, what we found that uh, so there's a give and take and there's a failure and success rate with that and a recovery because we understood uh, every year that they would come to us and try to exchange information with us. Right. But many times with so much anxiety about our son's be, uh, ability to make it there, we would in turn become anxious and it would right. render that interaction yeah. useless. Yeah. Right. No, I, I've been there. Um, <laughs> been there. But you know what I wanted to ask you is, you know, is you talk about how you went through this process I mean, you were active learners with lots of persistence throughout this, and it seems to me Idris must have picked up something about the learning process and persistence just watching y'all move through the process of parenting at Dalton. I mean, does that, did you, I, I have to believe that your work here was not just, you know, it was, you were an example to him of how you deal um, in territory that is maybe strange. Uh, that's kind of idealistic. Thing. Well, I think I think definitely it's been absorbed. The question is, you know, we're, we're they're still growing, right? So, right. so, so we're, we're 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 witness now, observers of you know the degree to which all of that has has sunk in and seeing it, you know, in action in college. So we're seeing some evidence of of uh, of uh, his adapting some of those same uh, 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 attributes attributes uh, 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 and and defense mechanisms. Uh, we also see that our younger son is an early adapter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In fact, uh, he's probably, you know, much more, much, much quicker to adapt these. You know, I, we were somewhere else and um, we were, I don't know where we were, upstate New York. And, and we called him because he was with a babysitter. He said that he was nervous about his basketball game. Uh, he had a level of anxiety, uh, which made his playing difficult. So he had Googled anxiety and <laughs> basketball and was trying to figure out how to calm himself so he could perform. That's and fabulous. Have a, a That's big game. Oh, okay. Well, um, some of it is sinking in. <laughs> yeah, that is fabulous. So. so Talk to me. We've done. I've done a number of focus groups with middle class African American parents, um, and one of the things I find is a uh, sometimes a reluctance to talk uh, to name race um, as the problem. Um, have you experienced that? Oh yes. It's and like uh, why do know, why do we do that? Because it's difficult. It's painful. It's, painful. it's difficult. That's like asking me. You know. Uh, uh, you know, I'm a bull rider, and uh, why did I want to get on the toughest bull, right? <laughs> Look, I, I, I want to get on the rocking chair and uh -huh. get through life the easy way. And I, and I don't mean any disrespect, but I'm saying, I'm saying when you talk about difficult areas, your heart races. Yes. Uh, you feel rejection by that person. Uh, you might get angry. And the point is that... Uh, it's a challenge um, every time you you do it, uh, and it challenges the primordial concerns that we have of acceptance. Mm -hmm. And even though we feel we're not accepted, we're uh, we, we, we're less ex accepted if we right. we bring that up. But 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 what we know is that everyone is disadvantaged by not having that difficult conversation. 
Right. And you know, and and in in the research that we've done around our book Promises Kept, it's 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 reiterated over and over again through some of the research that's out there that uh, the, the the more we talk about race in a responsible way to our kids, the better they do. Um, it may be painful, but it's necessary. It's part of that, you know, affirming that yes, I can be in that AP class. I'm not internalizing something that I'm not talking about and rationalizing a different reason for which I'm not, you know, going, uh, having my child get into AP classes, even though he's capable. So it's 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 a necessary discussion, and it's a discussion both about uh, uh, the obstacles that exist and what the structural racism that exists, but also it's about providing, you know, the narrative of, of, of pride and integrity and struggle that we can embrace and that allows us to, you know, make, do the necessary challenges. And it's it's also the most, one of the most common human defense mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And that denial. defense mechanism is called denial. denial. Yeah. And so, uh, what happens, uh, you know, speaking of research, uh, Ron Ferguson looked at uh, African American families and he looked at the achievement gap. Mm -hmm. And he found, and although he clearly acknowledges that achievement gap is, is uh, uh, most often associated with socioeconomics and structural limitations, what he noticed is that when you go up the socioeconomic ladder, uh, the gap actually gets wider. Mm -hmm. So he looked at families who made 30 and 40 and 50,000 white and black, and he saw that the gap existed, but it was small. But the gap between two families that made 100,000 or two families that made 200 or 300 uh, got exponentially bigger. And he attributed that, that to denial, to the, to the need to not to look at what's going on and to not intervene on their children's uh, be, uh, uh, behalf. You know, what we like to say is uh, color blindness uh, is, uh, is, is nice, but it won't protect your child uh, from the constant barrage of uh, microaggressions right. which are right. occurring on a daily basis. We want them to have skills to, to deal with those microaggressions. Right. But, you know, I mean, <clears throat> there is some, I think, fantasy among middle-class African Americans um, that, you know, wealth can protect us um, from the hurt of race. Um, yeah. And that fantasy keeps us from dealing head-on with the hurt that race does despite our money, right? Yeah, there's the, this idea that wealth protects us, and also in some cases we've drunk the Kool-Aid about our exceptionalism, right? Oh, yeah, and we're real good at trying to separate ourselves and trying to say that we are somehow different um, than, you know, lower income African American families and that we've become something, you know, better and magical. And I think that that's real damaging sometimes. Very dangerous. Well, well the biggest damage from that, uh, it stops the discussion of growth mindset. Mm -hmm. you know, so, Talk so, more about that. Well, the. The sense that we are all capable of learning at a very high level, that the brain is not fixed at birth, but in fact grows and adapts and allows us to do amazing things which are limited by our own imagination. But once I said, I'm special, I get this, and you can't get it, right? Uh, I stop teaching you. Mm -hmm. I stop having high expectations. Uh, and you stop learning. And I benefit from the, the difference between us. Uh, that I've manufactured. That, uh, right, exactly, exactly. It's, and, and it's illusory. And that's possibly why the, perhaps part of the next generation you know, is, is, is not thriving in the same way. You know? so, so what we say is that we, are, we, do not, we believe in a growth mindset. And then we also have to convince other parents other teachers uh, and politicians that that to have this growth mindset means that we all make more, we all live better, we all live longer because the pie becomes larger because it's not a you you against us. Some people have estimated the cost of this uh, yeah. this gap to be tr two trillion dollars a year, no. and uh, and so that's two trillion dollars. 
that suburban white families are not going to have access to. That's less uh, goods sold. That's more money spent on jails and prisons as opposed to uh, uh, economic growth. So we we. We've frozen. Issues out there, and that people are beginning to embrace some of these solutions. So you've talked, you've talked about sort of the struggles with kids of getting them to study. You've talked about the struggles of having honest conversations with other African American parents. Can you talk a little bit about the struggles with the institution of school itself? Hmm. Okay. Well, I'm going to let Michelle do that. Oh. <laughs> No, no, the reason because we argue about this all the time. Uh, and, and so her deal is that uh, let's talk about the schools. But okay. I want to uh, have the bigger uh, viewpoint is that the schools may have been easier than many of the other institutions. 